recently announced their new Polaris initiative. We'll be descri describing the vision for, for Bear Chain and Polaris here. And many bearers in, in their Discord have come and invaded our, our chat here to hear the message of Dev Bear today. Dev Bear, it's such a privilege to have you here today. Uga Booga, we're excited to hear from you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Ed. I really appreciate uh, the oppor the opportunity to get up here and uh, share with share with everyone what we've been working on for the past little while. Awesome. So we'll take it away, and uh, we will do audience questions at the end. Audience, if you have questions, you can feel free to ask them. On the right hand side, there's an icon for you to click on to ask questions. And Dev Bear, take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Let me just get to uh, get this going here. I'll pull up the slides. One second. Perfect. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate y'all taking time out of your day. Um, so I'm Dev Bear, uh, CTO and co-founder of BearChain, and I'm going to be talking to you guys not only about BearChain, but about one of our most recent initiatives, BearChain Polaris, um, which is how we're enabling EVM compatibility on BearChain. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm the CTO and co-founder of BearChain. Previously, before my uh, my new life as an online uh, online bear, I was a senior distributed systems engineer at Apple, um, working on like low level Bluetooth and networking type stuff, um, which is how I got a lot of the background in P2P and like the network stack um, and all the learnings there. Uh, previous to that, I studied software engineering at the University of Waterloo in Canada, um, and I've been in crypto for a really long time, very adjacently. Back when I was in high school, I got really into Minecraft and building these like Java plugins for them. One of the ones that I developed was actually to allow users to use the chat in game as a CLI in order to trade Bitcoin as part of the in-game economy. Um, took a bunch of time away from crypto, kind of adjacently had a Coinbase account, traded ETH, traded BTC all through 2017 through the bull run. And then over COVID got really back into the development side and that's how BearChain is here today. Funnily enough though, BearChain started from something completely different. Um, it started from an NFT project of 101 JPEGs of bear smoking weed. Um, over the course of the past year, we've grown that community up to a community of over 50,000 people. And along this way, built out a team of startup founders, venture capitalists, DeFi founders, and traditional tech alum, all of which are contributing to not only make the, the bears, the, the JPEGs better, but also help build bear chain as well and make both it and Polaris a reality. So before we dive into the framework and about Polaris, I'd like to just cover about what bear chain is. So BearChain is a fully EVM compatible L1 built on Cosmos, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't use proof of stake. It uses what we call proof of liquidity. And the idea behind proof of liquidity is we wanted a civil resistance mechanism that allowed for systemically building liquidity as a poor primitive. Um, through our time trading throughout DeFi 1.0 and DeFi 2.0 era, we noticed that a lot of these alt L1 chains had trouble building and maintaining incentive schemes that made sense and often left a lot of the projects building on these chains high and dry when those liquidity incentives burned out. Additionally, we wanted to solve stake centralization. And by having a mechanic that allows for validators to distribute rewards to different liquidity pairs that are built into the network, we create an incentive for users to stake their tokens, not only with the highest or the most top validators, but any validator that is incentivizing a pair that they may be interested in. Additionally, by having this infrastructure built in at a chain level, it incentivizes protocols building on the chain to run infrastructure, especially validators, and really allows them to be part of the ecosystem as opposed to just building on it. To sum this up in a visualization, we can view this as this following chart. So the idea is a user can delegate their BGT, which in our system stands for the bear governance token, to a validator of their choosing. Validators will produce blocks based on the appropriate weight that they've created. But unlike the traditional system where validators would be earning rewards back to them and their delegates, these rewards get pushed into a series of liquidity pools. Interestingly enough, the validator chooses the weight at which these rewards go in. So a validator could say, for instance, if they really want liquidity in ETH or BTC, they could say, I want you know half my block reward to go to ETH liquidity pools and the other half to go into BTC. This, these BGT rewards are sent to the liquidity providers of these pools and ultimately routed back to the user, which can then go and delegate back to the validator. The second piece of the system is a bribe layer that allows for validators to incentivize not only liquidity providers, but also users to just delegate BGT that they have. By every time this validator produces a block, its delegates will also get a portion of not only the transaction fees from that block, but this external token that the validator has provided as well. This is, as you may kind of allude, as I alluded to, really helps protocols building on the chain because it creates incentive. It allows them to really be part of the chain and have this core liquidity engine where they can utilize it to build liquidity in like their governance token, for instance. So to recap, 
the core sense of proof of liquidity is to systemically build the liquidity, solve centralization, stake centralization, and then ultimately incentivize protocols to run infrastructure. To cap it off, the idea is that we want the capital that's being used to secure the network to also be productive and help fulfill and drive the ecosystem. Coming back to Polaris and, and Ethereum in general, a lot of people asked us why build on EVM. And the reason that we saw it from a developer perspective is we wanted Verichain to have the greatest developer experience possible. And the EVM ecosystem is just vastly, vastly more mature than, other, than others that we've seen in crypto. Smart contract frameworks like Foundry and Hardhat, combined with libraries like Soulmate and Open Zeppelin, when also combined with some of these new kind of interesting DeFi primitives like ERC4626, really allow for a composable nature of the ecosystem while also making it really easy to build on the chain. When we look at other ecosystems, they don't necessarily have the same maturity and they don't have all of these, all of these protocols and things built in that allow it to kind of work in a cohesive environment. Um, you know, for instance, can anyone even name any any non EVM tooling that they use on a regular basis? I'm gonna obviously be biased here, but I I, I can't, right? Um, and we notice this when we look at the TVL of the chains. Um, I got these these numbers off of DeFi Llama last night, and you know, 55 billion in TVL is spread across all of the EVM compatible chains. Well, we see across the non EVM compatible chains, it's only around two billion. And this kind of leads me to believe that if you're able to build an ecosystem where the developer user experience is great. The tooling is great and it's easy to build on top of. It really is a way to capture value and ensure that you can build a thriving ecosystem. Um, and you kind of the numbers, the numbers tell the story for itself. So now that we've decided on EVM, why did we decide to build Polaris? And the reason for that is, as we mentioned before, I wanted to make sure that we had the ability for people building in our community to have a stable, reliable smart contract platform to build on. But we also recognize that app chains are really powerful. Things like Cosmos and having ABCI and being able to have this life cycle to the way that a block is built can allow you to tie in things into this life cycle in a predictable way. You can use like begin and end block, for instance, in Cosmos to set up cron type jobs or have PID controllers fire off or things that on Ethereum would really enforce you having to run like an off chain service like Gelato when we could build it into the chain, allowing for it to be more reliable and also accrue more value to our community. So to sum it off, Polaris is a modular plugin-based EVM execution framework designed with app chains in mind. And we really wanted to make sure that Verichain had a solid foundation to build off of, which is why we decided to build this framework. A large part of the reason why integrating EVM into these application chain frameworks is so difficult is Go Ethereum just has so much nuance to it. There's so many little gotchas here and there, and the way that it's engineered, it never really was designed to be imported and put into other chains and used with different consensus engines. Um, and there's so many things that can go wrong if you're not absolutely handling everything perfect. Um, and the goal of Polaris is to take that nuance away from the chain developer and make it so that that developer only has to worry about really, really simple, easy to implement functions that make it so that you don't have to worry about all this nuance. You don't have to worry about the compatibility being off. You don't have to worry about the RPC, some functions not working. All you have to do is implement a very simple set of these plugins and then everything kind of just works. And that's where we see the future where a world in which we had all these different pluggable consensus frameworks and a pluggable EVM, you really allow developers to have so much power that they can just have a, I want this type of consensus and I want an EVM to put it together and really allow teams building to focus on what's important as opposed to just trying to make you know, an RPC work or trying to make you know, blocks be built correctly. So what we did is we did this, but on Cosmos. So the Polaris framework in itself is this general framework that can be used on any application chain, but we chose to build it in Cosmos. So the way you can think about it is Cosmos has this narrative where you have all these different layers and they're all their own separate pieces that are completely decoupled from each other. Starting at the networking level, which is kind of your P2P, like your, your low level there. Then you have your consensus engine framework. So in the case of Cosmos, that's like Comet BFT, formerly known as Tendermint. And then at the application level, you have the Cosmos SDK, which allows developers to build these dev chains. We kind of see Polaris as a step that goes on the top of that pyramid where you have this EVM virtual machine that is glued into the host chain, the Cosmos chain, but it's not coupled with it. It's just kind of sitting on its own layer. And what makes that really interesting is it allows for even more separation, which is nice for making sure that you have all of that RPC compatibility and allowing the EVM to interact and to run like it's designed to. When we first went out to build build Bear Chain, though, it wasn't just you know it wasn't just Cosmos we were thinking about. 
we had thought about a lot of different options. We had looked at building on Optimism. We had looked at building an AVAX subnet. Uh, we had looked at using Ethermint. And all of these solutions definitely had things that were great about them. But at the end of the day, they didn't tick all the boxes. that we needed for Bearchain. One of the things that led us to building Polaris is we wanted to not be locked into an ecosystem. By choosing one of the former options, you're kind of committing to being locked into that ecosystem of tooling versus with Polaris, it truly is platform agnostic and was designed from the ground up to be able to integrate into any application specific blockchain you're looking for. We also wanted to ensure that everything was set up such that if we wanted to turn it into a roll up or we wanted chains to roll up to Polaris chains, that that was all able to be done. And then also due to the nature of Barachain's DeFi logic being built into the actual core of the chain itself, stateful precompiles and having a great developer experience for building stateful precompiles was a non-starter for us. An additional benefit by Barachain Polaris is that you're able to kind of have these native cross-chain contracts that are enabled via IBC. And lastly, and arguably the most important thing to me, was that we wanted to make sure that the RPC compatibility of Barachain was absolutely perfect. Um, from, from talking to institutional providers and people integrating into EVM chains, one of the things that they're very, very picky with is making sure that the RPC compatibility is perfect. We had heard stories of things like custodial providers and Oracle solutions and things of that nature not being able to integrate into certain EVM chains because of the compatibility issues. And that was something that we noticed with Ethermint that really we weren't overall happy with. Um, is that because of the fact that it was using this Tendermint RPC and then wrapping it and making it trying to mimic a Go Ethereum RPC, it didn't really work that well. So for Bearchain Polaris, we wanted to make sure that we had that native RPC that we know would just work out of the box using all the native message handling, using the native gas oracle pricing, the native fee history logic, all of that made it so that our RPC compatibility, despite being a Cos EVM on Cosmos, is next to perfect. So diving a bit more under the hood and looking at the architecture of how we built Polaris is we borrowed some of the semantics from rollups in order to make it kind of work. Conceptually, you can think about Polaris as running two blockchains within a blockchain. We have our host chain, which in our case is Cosmos, but could be any, any application chain. And then you have the Polaris chain, which is the Ethereum chain running inside of it. Unlike rollups, though, we have this concept of a shared state and what we like to call atomic settlement, where the host chain block actually contains a superset of all of the things in the ETH block. So the host chain will pass these Ethereum transactions down to the Ethereum chain, and then the Ethereum chain will post effectively the state route and the list of all those changes back up to the host chain. What this allows for is it allows for the ETH Ethereum block that's being built to be a re side of that. The next slide kind of shows this bifurcation even more is that you see that we have the host chain on the bottom here and then the Polaris chain or the Ethereum chain at the top and they talk through this one communication layer. Um, and the idea is that the host chain is responsible for consensus, the host chain is responsible for P2P, it's responsible for actually building the blocks, it's responsible for all of the things that a blockchain would be. Um, and then you have the Ethereum block effectively or the Ethereum chain just running all the transactions and handling things there. The host chain does need to do some things though. So it needs to kind of do three basic functions. The first of which is it needs a way to provide these transactions to the Ethereum chain. And it does that through what we call the transaction pool plugin. Secondly, um, it needs a way to actually make the chain, the Ethereum chain churn itself. So because the Polaris slash Ethereum chain doesn't have its own consensus engine and it doesn't have these things that will actually drive the chain forward and have it get blocks, it needs a way to, to have that happen. And that's kind of what the set of, set of plugins on the host chain, which we've kind of summarized to be the engine plugin, um, allows that to do. Additionally, um, and kind of in the context of bear chain is super important to us, is we have the precompile plugin, which allows for the communication between the, the two state trees, the EVM state tree and the state tree of the host chain. Um, and that allows us to do all of these stateful precompile work and all of these kind of creative things by creating a consistent and a, and a very singular point of communication between the Ethereum chain and the host chain. Moving kind of back to the Ethereum chain, we see it follows kind of some standard terminology that you would see if you're, if you're familiar with, with the Geth code base. You, we have a blockchain object, we have a state processor. There's a very predictable and understandable life cycle to how those work. Um, then we have our RPC backend, again, kind of taken right from Go Ethereum, and then we have an actual native Geth JSON RPC service um, that ensures the perfect compatibility there. Diving into the precompiles, we see that precompile development today is pretty clunky. 
Um, there's really no tooling for it. It's kind of this thing where you have to like manipulate this byte array that comes in and you have to just kind of do some stuff. There's really no framework. There's really no procedure to follow. And it can make it a really daunting task and really easy to introduce bugs because there's no cooling and there's no life cycle to how you build these things. So one of the things we did with Polaris was we designed what we call the PDK or Polaris or precompiled development kit. And the what we wanted to do with the PDK is we wanted to make writing precompiles feel very, very similar to writing smart contracts. We wanted to make it so if somebody's really fluent in Solidity or really understands Viper and know the semantics there, that with minimal learning and minimal time invested, they could go and write a precompile contract themselves. And what we do is the developer is responsible for creating two files. The first file I have to create is a Solidity interface that represents all of the functions that their precompile will have. Um, and then on the right side, you have your actual precompile contract, which in the case of Polaris is written as a Go struct. Um, and what the Go struct is, is it has a little bit of metadata, and then it really is just a bunch of functions like this. That um, you just basically have all your precompile functions as individual functions that show like up this. And then we have a process that brings them all together and effectively maps the function signatures on the left to all of these Go structs on the right. And what this looks like visually is it looks something like this chart where you have your developer who's supposed to be implementing your interface and then your implementation. One is in Solidity, one is in Go. Um, and then we have what we call effectively, it's a compiler or a transpiler that takes those files and compiles them down into what we call a precompiled container, kind of taking the, the analogy from Docker. That precompiled container can then be built in with the host chain. And now the host chain has this fake smart contract that can be run that was written very much like a real smart contract from a developer experience perspective. Um, so what's really cool about this is it cre we've created a way to build precompiles that have a tooling and have a life cycle around them. And it makes writing them really, really easy and familiar, which is just a benefit to adoption and making sure that they work correctly. Now here we have an example of using it on a Cosmos chain. So here we're building a liquid staking example where we're using the Cosmos staking module and we're building an ERC20 token that wraps it. So on the Cosmos example, we have a get active validators function on the precompile that allows us to get the current set of validators. And then we're just creating a simple naive example here where we're just gonna delegate to one of them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start up a local Cosmos chain running Polaris. You can, if you clone the Polaris GitHub repo, you can run this at home yourself as well. So we'll just wait for the, the chain to spin up here. Once the chain started up, we're gonna look at the validator set and see that we have one validator because we're running on a local node and we can see that it has some amount of tokens to it. From here, we can go and deploy using Forge. We can deploy a, that liquid staking smart contract, wait for the transaction to confirm, and we can see that it was deployed at this address here. From there, we can go and call that contract directly and we'll give it a little more ether just so we can see a, a different number other than a one here. So now we're gonna delegate, that's calling the liquid staking derivative and we get a response here. Now notice there's a ton of logs here as well. And the idea behind this is we wanted to extend the Cosmos SDK modules to actually be able to pass the SDK events in as Ethereum logs. This is really great for data science tools and just general usability because it gives the developer more insight into how, what, what's actually happening inside the Cosmos SDK module. So if we see here in the log, we can see that that's the, the precompile address there. It really makes it so that the precompiles feel like you're interacting with a real smart contract and make it feel like less of this hacked together thing. Really making sure that it was polished around the edges was super important to us. We then can query on the Cosmos side and see that the delegator shares were increased on that validator. Now, this is just one of the examples of what we can do. Using the PDK, we're working with a variety of other teams to build new and exciting things that will be able to be integrated onto Polaris chains. We're really good guy, We're really good friends with the guys over at Skip, and we're playing with some ideas around how we can have a network of Polaris chains that all talk to each other through a common mempool. I also personally think it would be super cool if there was a way to use the PDKs to have visibility into the mempool. Like imagine you had a smart contract that allowed you to see what's in the mempool, you know, see gas, see what's going on and provide more visibility from the virtual machine into what's happening at the base layer. I think there's a lot of cool ideas that can go into there.
Scott and the team over at Argus are utilizing the player's PDKs for cross-VM communication. So one of the things they're working on is this virtual machine um, and being able to talk between the virtual machine and an EVM is something that they're potentially looking at doing. And then additionally, the guys over at Cata Labs are building a Cosmos cross-chain liquidity network, and they're helping us with integrating players' PDKs with IBC, interchain accounts, interchain security, and interchain queries as well. And these are just some examples. There's also lots of other potential things we can do here. We could integrate Rollkit into players as it is Cosmos compatible. We've talked about this idea of having Bera chains where we have this network of players chains that are all able to roll up to Bera chain. That's something we've think about as well. And just in general, more host chain applications. Like because of the way that players was built, it's designed to be completely agnostic to any underlying application framework. And by this, we can plug it into anything. This being one of the ideas that we've kind of thought of. All in all, we're super excited to be able to contribute to these and also really excited to see what else the community comes with over the coming months. We wanted Polaris to be something for not only Barachain, but the community as well. And that's why we built everything with modularity in mind. We really want to see more and more chains get involved as it benefits not only us, but the broader community as well. Anyways, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you all listening to this talk, and we're super excited to, to introduce players to you guys now. Um, my socials and stuff are on the screen here. Um, if you're ever interested in chatting about anything precompile related, EVM related, Cosmos related, mempool, MEV related, anything, definitely feel free to shoot me a message. And also, if you're interested in contributing, um, my GitHub and the Barachain GitHub are there as well. Um, definitely check out the GitHub repo. There's tons of uh, tons of stuff to be done there, and we make sure that um, there's a lot of open source tasks and stuff. We make sure to to label them and make sure that people can jump in um, with some kind of hitters there. So, um, yeah. Any any questions from the audience? I see there's a ton of unread messages. Thank you, Dev Bear. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put you back on screen here. Uh, amazing Great. presentation, by the way. Super inspiring what you're building with Polaris. And uh, and the audience Thank has you. a ton of questions. The most <laughs> I'm sure they question, do. The most important question here is the question, when? Just W-E-N. And that's that's the whole question, basically. <laughs> when? Um, so I can, the question. It, I it, can may, it may be referring to, it may be referring to when airdrop. It may be referring to when token. It may be, be referring to when. It could refer to and it could refer to lots lots of things. It could. Um, what I can say is, for anyone who's in the Bear Chain Partnership Discord, we have released uh, information for a, a kind of private development network. Um, so specifically for Polaris, we have a development network up that teams can start to build on. Um, so if anyone is interested in building in on that, um, definitely reach out to Smokey. He has all the information there, um, and he can get you set up with uh, with keys and the RPCs and stuff there. And then as, as that network gets more mature, we'll start rolling into uh, a public dev net and then eventually uh, a test net and, and other, uh, other token related things potentially down the line as well, as I know the, uh, the community is interested in that one. Awesome. And, uh, and when you guys were building Polaris, did you guys take a look at Evmos as well? And what was your thoughts and analysis on Evmos? Yeah, so originally we we were going to use Ethernet with full full transparency. And it was something where as we got deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, it was really difficult to integrate all the features that we wanted on top of it. Um, Ethermint's kind of been this project that's been around in Cosmos for a really, really long time. It's kind of come and gone. It's been through kind of multiple hands and multiple kind of organizations that have been maintaining it. Um, and it turned, it got to the point where it was something where we were sitting there and it was like, if we want this to be the base plate of bear chain, if the EVM is what we want to be, you know, that's where all the people are going to be building. That's the core of it. That's what's important. We need to get the dev UX right. We need to make sure that everything there is in tip top shape. It just got to the point where it was like, we need to have control over this and make sure that we're doing things in the way that, that we think is going to give us the best developer experience and make sure that people building on the chain have the best time. Um, and it really kind of hit the point where, okay, like we're going to build this and, you know, we want to make sure that everything is perfect for our community and we needed to make sure that. So we kind of took matters into our own hands and, and that's kind of how Polaris, Polaris started. Um, and a lot of that had to do with like the stateful precompiles and, and some of the, the Cosmos specific features that didn't really work out. And eventually it was like, okay, well, we can build this as a generic thing as well, which is ultimately going to make the, the architecture better for the Cosmos side. So that's kind of the, the history there for a, a longer answer to that question. Great. 
And then can you give us a quick overview of the, of the tri-token model and also what are the economic benefits of having proof of liquidity? Um, and, and just like in general, like like the, the model that you have is, is fairly transformative for the possible applications of DeFi. And can you, can you just let us know what's possible on BearChain going forward? Yeah, so to give a high level on, on the BearChain side of how the tri-token structure works is we have Bera, which is the gas token of the network. So that's what the, the EVM, so if you think about your ETH in the EVM, that would be what the Bera token would be. BGT, as we mentioned earlier, is the governance token, and that's effectively what's being used to create vote weight for the validators. Um, and then we also have a stable coin that's going to tie into the DEX as well, and that will be the medium of exchange through there. The idea behind bifurcating all the different tokens is all these different tokens have different stakeholders. Um, you know, if you're, you want to purely use Barachain as a way to build your application, you really only need the gas token, right? You're just like, oh, I want an EVM execution environment. You know, I need the gas token to pay for that, right? Um, if you're interested in getting involved with that whole liquidity network and getting the flywheel spinning, right? If you're building a protocol or something, you want to try to accumulate BGT because by accumulating BGT, you can run a validator, you can incentivize liquidity for your protocol. Um, and it really allows for this whole system to tie into protocols building on the chain. And at the end of the day, that's what was so important to us is we wanted to make sure that the protocols building on the chain really felt like they were a part of the chain. Um, and really felt like them getting involved with running infrastructure, them getting involved in you know, governance proposals and direction of where the tech will go and all these things. We wanted to make sure that it was very centered around people building because that's kind of where we started, right? We are builders by nature and we want to be able to tailor things to builders, not just from a technical perspective, but also making sure that we can have the chain support the needs of what they're building. Um, and by having this whole system, it allows validators who give back to the ecosystem and protocols who give back to the ecosystem the benefits of that system by being able to make sure that their tokens are, are super liquid and have all these attributes attached to them. Great. And, and uh, do you hope that other Cosmos chains will uh, adopt uh, uh, Polaris beyond just Barachain? Is that part of the vision or is it scoped mostly to Barachain? We definitely, in the long run, we want to make sure that everyone building in Cosmos and not even just Cosmos, other chains and other ecosystems as well have a an EVM that works for them and they don't have to go through the hassle that we went through. Um, we really want to see a world in which Polaris ends up being the, the default proof of stake EVM implementation where, you know, the mindset of somebody building, you know, maybe three years ago was like, oh, I'm going to go for work Geth. That was kind of what everybody did, right? Yeah, I want an EVM chain. Okay, I'm going to go for Geth. We would like to see a world in which instead of that, it's like, okay, I'm going to go pick my app chain framework and then I'm going to put Polaris into it. And that's the new the new default, if that, if that makes sense there. On the Cosmos side, I think it would be really cool because of all of these cross-chain interoperability things that have been built natively into IBC, once we get the pre-compiled contracts all hooked up for that, the more chains in Cosmos that can that can put Polaris into them, the more interoperability we get and the stronger the ecosystem becomes. Um, one of the things that has been a bit of a, a love-hate relationship with Cosmos for me personally has been as much as I love developing in Cosmos and as much as it's made a lot of the things with proof of liquidity possible, it's a really fragmented space. And it's really difficult in a world with just, you know, OP stack and with with AVAX and all these things, it's really difficult where if somebody comes to me and says, I want to build an EVM chain, what do I do? Until we built Polaris, it was really a hard sell for me to be like, you should be building in Cosmos. Um, and that's a big part of also why we wanted to build Polaris is we wanted to make it so that EVM on Cosmos wasn't this like second class version of the EVM, which I think has had this, this narrative in, in tech communities for a while where it's, you know, you have your chains like Phantom, you have your chains like AVAX, you have your chains like Mainnet, Optimism, where it's like, okay, these are really good, super compatible, everything works perfect. And then you had your Cosmos EVM chains and people were like, oh, well, it works, kind of. Um, and that's what we wanted to try to have Polaris change the narrative within Cosmos in, in that regard as well. Makes sense. And audience, you can, by the way, you can, audience, you can vote on the questions that we're going to ask Dev there. So if you go to the question mark icon on the right and you click on the question that you like the most, you can upvote it and then we will, uh, we will answer the questions democratically based on what the audience wants. Uh, in the meantime, I will ask one more of my questions, which is, um, I guess, um, what's been the biggest challenge when developing Polaris? Like, uh, as you started the project out, uh, what comes to mind in terms of the biggest challenges you overcame when you built it? I think the biggest challenge was 
making the semantics like that whole what i was saying about the semantics of geth really tie in in a way that made sense in the context of these app chains um because you're effectively you can think of it as like a translation layer between if i'm having a a block get built in we'll use cosmos as an example let's say i'm getting a tendermint block built and tendermint uses a different hashing and it uses different all these different things finding a way to build the abstraction such that we can come up with sort of a logical like injective mapping between like what's going on in the EVM land versus what's going on in the Cosmos land um, and making that in a way that is reproducible and logical and easy to follow. Um, a lot of the issues we've seen kind of, an, I, I hate to pick on Ethermint, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Um, for instance, their block hashes are wrong. So if you look at an, an Ethermint block and you look at what the JSON RPC block hash returns, it's not the real block hash. Um, and things like that don't really seem significant, but it can have really compounding effects when you look at, you know, is there a way to make sure this isn't a spoof block? Like, how do I know that this block is real? How do I, you know, how do I, if I want to build rollup infrastructure around this, I can't really do that because the block isn't real. So how do I verify? And it really starts a cascading problem. And that was kind of the whole, the whole challenge was making sure that, you know, we don't have a consensus engine that uses the same signatures as ETH. We don't have a, a framework that follows the same life cycle as ETH, but what can we do in order to make that if clo as close as possible, if not exactly the same, and do that in a way that's not only workable in Cosmos, but workable in an arbitrary generalized context as well. Awesome. All right, well, we, we have time for just three audience questions. So let's go to the top three based on the audience who vote. I'm going to start with the number three question, which is a question for you as a pseudonymous co-founder, which is, uh, are you wearing clothes right now? Will you will you make the honest confession to the audience? Confirm or deny? Uh, are you wearing I'm, clothes? I'm wearing, I'm wearing Puma flip-flops, Nike shorts, and a Nike dry fit shirt. That is, that is, right. the, that is the fit. That qualifies as clothes. And we have no way to verify that, by the way. <laughs> I trust you. You know, this could be an FTX thing where... We that's fair. You, but I, I'm going to take your word for it. So, so that's that. Next question uh, by vote. What is your kills, deaths, and assist uh, rate uh, numbers on Warzone? In, Will you on Warzone. The at, the, at, at the peak, it was like mid threes. I used to yeah. I used to stream on Twitch before I decided to start building Bear Smoking Weed Blockchain. So if you go dive on Twitch, you can maybe, maybe you'll find me. You don't know. But, um, but yeah, that would be it. Recently, probably not as good because I write code a lot now and build design documents. But back in the day, it was pretty good. Back in the day, I had an okay KDA on Dota 2, and that was my game. So I, <laughs> I respect that. I never, I never got super into Dota. I played League for a while, but I, that, was, that, one was, that one was tough on the mental. Oh, you're you're missing out, man. Dota is worth that. <laughs> and last question. This is the most important question: Is that there's a rumor that Vitalik is joining the team to be, become your intern? Um, it, can you confirm or deny this rumor? That is the number one, one number one question as voted by the audience. What is what is the dev bear response to that question? I I don't know. I think I think I'll uh, admit. I don't know. I think I'll have to leave that one to uh, to the community to 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 sit on for a while. You can't give them, you, you, Ed. You'll you'll have to you'll have to learn once you spend more time in the Discord. You can't give them everything right away. You gotta leave them. You gotta leave them a little cliffhanger. So I'm gonna leave I'm gonna leave that That's one right. for for I'll them, hear. and they can uh, they can spam my Discord on that one. Well, you know, I, we're we're so glad to have you here, Dev Bear, and you know, we all can't wait to get our honey. I'm a I'm a fan of honey myself, and uh, you guys are doing some fantastic work with Polaris. We can't wait to see your your full launch, and uh, we're excited to just have you here and to for you to choose this venue to unveil what you're working on. So we have learned a lot. Thanks you so much. And, and Beres, if you liked what you heard today, consider donating to charity at hacksummit.org. Uh, we're helping four important nonprofits. And Dev Bear, thanks again.